up. It's 35. It's like 35 and now it's, and it's 40, like 40. And it's like, wow. <laughs> and they're all looking at you. Yay. Mine still shows 35. Are y'all seeing 40? I got 41. Seeing 41. 41. Oh, no, participate 41. 41. 36 attendees. Holy cows. Six yeah. panelists. And a partridge. And a... Just Here's the out. jokes, folks. Yep, this is it. Hope you weren't expecting good jokes because you're not going to find them here. <laughs> it's not what we do. All right. I'm going to go ahead and get us started because it is 101 and I'm sure we have a lot to talk about. Oh, so, we do. Greetings oh, yes. to all. Welcome to the Music and Myth panel. My name is Emily Lewis. Um, you might remember me once again for if you were at the last panel. Um, but if you weren't at the last panel, you'll probably know me as Balder from Sassafras. Um, but I am also a Latin teacher, so I have a lot of interesting background to add to myth and music and other fun things like that. And I'm going to look that way and say, Batia, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm a Batia Wittenberg, also known as Batia the Tune. Um, I've been uh, involved in filk for uh, going on two and a half decades and in music for pretty much my entire life. Um, I've also been interested in uh, myth, although never actively involved in it in any kind of serious academic way um, for most of my, I was going to say most of my adult life, but no, definitely before that. Um, and so these are two things I love and they taste great together. So. <laughs> All right, Eric. Um, I am half of Cheshire Moon. Um, most of my grounding in mythology goes back to um, my, my misspent youth. Uh, my father was a theater teacher. Uh, we traveled a lot. I, I, I've got a degree in theater. I've done um, a lot of the Greek plays, um, a lot of Shakespeare. So that's, 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 that's kind of where I come from. Ada? Hi, I compose for Sassafras. I'm best known for doing Viking myth stuff. Uh, so I've done a lot of work with Viking myths, both composing with it and researching it. I'm also working toward my next novel series, Being Viking Myths, so I'm doing a different kind of research for that. Uh, but I am also a historian and do a lot on the reception and revival of Mediterranean classics in the Renaissance and afterwards. So I studied the history of reuse and reinterpretation of classic uh, academically as well, which gives a perspective on the way things get distorted. And Lizzie. And used. Um, hi, I'm Lizzie. I'm the other half of Cheshire Moon. Um, like many people here, I am a lyricist, songwriter, and I have um, always had a deep fascination with mythology. Um, I have a very wide cultural background and I am a huge history buff, and so I have done a lot of research into mythology and how it is reinterpreted and how it has been distorted in, in history by culture and perspective and gender and things of that nature. And so that's where I'm coming from. Okay, so we have, we have a lot of expertise. It is totally okay to chat lurk. Don't worry yes, about that. Please feel free to chat lurk. Hello, people. <laughs> um, all right, so... Uh, we have we have a lot of little topics we want to cover, um, but I guess we should probably just start off with when you're you when you are working with mythology and song, and you are trying to kind of set it together. We we were talking about in the pre-panel discussion. We were we were chatting about musical style and storytelling. And let's sort of hit that one first. Um, so I'm not going to go cold calling somebody, but I know I know people have a lot of a lot of opinions. One of the things that I have found effective is when you're dealing with a particular mythology, study the music of the region. Study the, there are certain modes. You'll hear the word modal a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, there are certain scales that are used in certain cultures. Um, when you hear certain 
scales and certain kinds of music, you'll, your mind is drawn to the Middle East or Ireland or Germany or, um, or Asia or, you know, Southeast Asia. You know, these types of music are intrinsic to these regions of the world. And so when you're dealing with myth from a particular region, keep in mind the the music and the the tonality that reminds you of that region when you're deal when you're trying to compose the music because that can help you establish mood yes um but something else that we did discuss um in the in the pre-panel was be very careful uh, yes. uh, when it comes to mythology you need to be very careful because um when you're dealing with a mythology that you do not have a personal connection to that culture research 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 and did i mention research and um, research and research um you want to talk to people who are a part of that culture you want to try to talk to people who have connection to that culture who have you know be willing to listen to people who have more knowledge than you Oops. and also pay attention to the healthy and toxic aspects of culture and presentation of the information because it's very it's very easy to fall into toxic or negative trappings of a particular thought process and not necessarily know that you're doing it right away and once you're there it's difficult to get out of that quagmire so it's yes. just something to be very mindful of as you're going through this mm -hmm. Now this this is uh, I feel like this is especially a problem in um, problem is not the word this is especially an issue challenge in cases challenge I like that I like that challenge um, yeah. in cases where a particular uh, facet of um, some cultures mythology has already been picked up and disseminated through mainstream Western uh, literature. And so like, if I say a Wendigo, you may think you know what that is. I guarantee there's a good chance you know at le that you know a version of it that is not the original. I don't know what the original is and I'm aware of that. And I know of at least three unrelated, very dissimilar, equal, almost certainly equally wrong versions of the Wendigo myth. Um, if you think you know what a golem is, and you know what a golem is because you've played Dungeons and Dragons, you don't know what you a golem is. You don't know. <laughs> um, so, uh, and of course, this is something that uh, Eric brought up when we were starting to talk about this uh, prior, so I'm sorry, Eric, I'm stealing it. Yoink! Um, that uh, when, when you are talking to people of the uh, cultures that you are trying to find out about, you need to be willing to accept it if someone says, maybe this is something that you shouldn't write about. And sometimes you will get, maybe this is something you shouldn't write about before you have read this book and this book or talked to this researcher and this other researcher and gained more information. And I feel like learn more stuff first is always easier to accept than don't do it at all we hate don't do it at all we really really yeah hate don't do we, it at we, all we. if someone says to you don't do it at all take it seriously yeah because there is such a thing as a closed culture where unless you have been actively invited in by a member of that culture to participate in their stuff you've got no business doing anything with you it at all. No business Even if into you that think circle. it's really cool and it would fit so well with the syncretic thing you're doing, just don't. Really just don't. Yeah. And and trust the people who tell you these things because they are trying to because when someone says that to you, they are trying to protect you. They're trying to save your butt. They're trying to save your tail from getting fried because it will be. And so, you know, be willing to, to do that research, to have those conversations and be willing to accept it's not rejection. That is when you get those, when you have to deal with those kinds of conversations, you are not being rejected. You're simply being informed. It, it, it kind of boils down to that there are certain things that do not belong to you and they belong to, to someone else. You yes. should let them have that. Yes. yes. Um, which is painful and unpleasant when it happens, but 
it being painful and unpleasant doesn't mean that you should say, well, I'm doing it anyway, because I want to. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they, they no. really, really don't. Um, I'm going to tag Ada here for a second. Um, both from, from an academic perspective on all of this, uh, but also from a musical and stylistic perspective, you have a lot that you can bring to this discussion. Yeah, I mean, there were two different, two radically different things that Lizzie brought up at the beginning. One about total music and, you know, using sounds and melodies from different regions, which is utterly unrelated to the research question, and both of them are a large conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've been more in the research one, so I guess I'll do that one first. Uh, but one thing that can be extraordinarily helpful is to look not just for, you know, books about the myths that you're interested in writing about, but find a history of the transmission and study of that Ooh, yes. set of myths. Yeah. Yes. Because that's what'll tell you where the distortions have come in and what the political problems and challenges surrounding that myth are. Because anything that is old, <laughs> has gone through transformations over time yes. and has been reinterpreted and uh, evaluated in different ways twisted. and figuring out, well, I mean, no, not necessarily twisted because sometimes it'll just be that it evolves, right? And the, it the evolves. Greek That's pagan a gods of Ovid are not the Greek pagan gods of Homer. No, and no. We're not gonna no. say that Ovid has destroyed Homer. We're gonna say these are two different stages in the evolution of a thing. Mm -hmm. You want to understand that evolution the fact that they have changed in between and when you're trying to reconcile different sources and different time periods what you do you then also want to understand the kinds of errors and distortions that have been introduced via the history of studying the thing uh, a lot of our myths for example are in the state of scholars working hard to undo what happened in the 19th century when there was that vogue for the theory that there were universal myth archetypes yeah. Monomyths. That we wanted to uh, break down everything into this archetype and this archetype and this archetype, which was a huge leap forward over before when the answer was all myths and gods are stupid except the Greek ones and the others are unworthy of study and their manuscripts should be burned. Like, you know, it's yeah, it's a big step, but it's better. But nonetheless, it was problematic distortion. And so you to this day get a lot of versions of myths that are shaped by that and very radically different from what you get from a modern history book about yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. So if you get a book of here are Viking stories that was printed in 1940, you're gonna get radically different interpretations in which, for example, Loki is a trickster god. From if you get a more recent book like Caroline Larrington's who is much more, here is what the stories actually tell us, these archetypes aren't appropriate to apply Note that if you did apply them, the most trickster godlike figure in this is Frigg, followed by Odin, followed by uh, Loki, you know, that, that, that getting used to what the old versions were. When the important part isn't just getting the most accurate version, right? Because we're not right either, and the next generation of scholarship will be even better than us. The important part is to trace the history of what the different versions have been so you know what you're working with. So you know if the thing that excites you is the idea of Loki as trickster god, that that is a largely 19th century idea and what it means and how to work with that intelligently and what kinds of sources will help you refine that. You want to know what the history and the evolutions are so that you can choose among different versions and readings prudently and sensitively and know what you're doing and know the politics of different iterations. Yeah, and now from, from, a pure, from a purely storytelling point of view, you could make the argument that it doesn't matter necessarily which is the, the uh, purest or most authoritative or most authentic version of the story so much as which version of the story is the one that appeals to you and you is a story to... you want to explore. Yeah. Yes. But and yes, how... it's super important to be aware which version of it have you chosen to explore? Don't think that the version you're working with is the is authority, absolute. correct, yeah. the, the, the real one, and all the other versions are um, either uh, primitive and silly or uh, modern, and, and, uh, modern and and modern uh, and uh, decadent or uh, whatever the different, different sorts of uh, differences would uh, 
I yeah. forget where that sentence was going, but you get the idea. Yeah. Because often, especially, there will be there will be complex politics behind multiple different versions of it. Mm -hmm. And yes. knowing the intersections between them is also valuable. So with Viking myth in particular, there's sort of four versions that are the major ones that you're dealing with right now, excluding pop culture Marvel influence stuff. Mm -hmm. There's the leftover 19th century archetype reading version. There's the current Viking historians trying very hard to get at what we can know with certainty, which is very little, and making a very pared down version, where rather than the 19th century thesis would be, here is how trickster gods work universally, the Vikings fit into a system with Homer. Current Viking scholarship, the thesis is much more likely to be, we think there was a stick. Here is a picture of excavated stick one. Here is a picture of excavated stick two. This stick resembles a stick that was mentioned in a text that exists, therefore the stick. Uh, that's usually gonna be the thesis of the state of modern scholarship, which notice isn't useful for telling stories either. No, it isn't. We also and have going on very actively within Viking myth, the white supremacist version. Uh, we also uh -huh. have the mid to late 20th century dominating in the 1960s and 70s revival version, which tried, which was heavily influenced by Wicca and tried to uh, inject a lot of feminism into the myth and which compared to what modern historians think is true about them, vastly inflate the significance and dignity of a lot of the goddesses. And in which Odin isn't uh, having serial affairs or sexual assaults, these are sequential marriages. Uh, and all of these women are goddesses who take turns being queen. And that isn't in the primary sources, but it very much is in this version that you get in the middle of the 20th century, which is what a lot of the non-white supremacist modern ASATRU practitioners grew up on and believe in. And just knowing that is really helpful because you know, I'm at the state where I've read enough Viking stuff that I can Google a random Viking word, go to a random website, read about a paragraph and a half and know which of the four branches this person is getting their information from. Uh, and understanding the balance of what you're working with, because you, you're writing a song with a story. You're going to tell the story you're going to tell. You want to know what relationship that story is going to have to the different audiences who care especially about the story, who are then going to see it. You want to know that there is this feminist branch of Asa True, and that there is separately this white supremacist branch of Asa True, and that there is separately this archetype residue uh, uh, syncretic reading of the Vikings, and separately that there are tired exhausted Viking scholars were desperately trying to convince people that Loki is Odin's brother, not Thor's brother, uh, and, and sad every time anyone interferes with this project. And that your song is going to affect the projects of all of those communities. So if you know that all those communities exist, you can then think prudently not only about what you put in the song, but even how you talk about the song when you introduce it. Mm -hmm. or you yeah. them, to make sure that you are doing right by and being supportive of the communities that you want to affirm, being polite to the communities that you're being something different from but still respect, and attempting to offer the correct kind of corrective to the communities that you think are messing something up, while also being prepared for the politics and backlash that that can present. That, that is always going to happen because you're not going to be able to please everybody. But if you don't know what the camps are, Yes. Then you can't position yourself prudently. Um, and sometimes it's not that you want to change anything about your song. It's that you want to change how you talk about the song when you introduce it or put it online. Also true, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. Stating your sources or stating that you're going with X version and so on. Mm -hmm. Being sure you cite your sources is usually good. Um, Ish, because they'll cite the same sources. Well, yes, but like... <laughs> At the very least, trying to say, like, I got my information from here. Mm -hmm. um, so if they think that you're wrong, or maybe it would behoove you to read something else, or maybe this book will help inform this a little bit more, and these two things can coexist, that helps. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, one of the things that I have uh, that I started doing when we were doing our ver our song Persephone is I got most of my thought process from this from Edith Hamilton's mythology. 
which is very much toward that um, 19th century archetypal. You know, archetypal kind of situation. And I was very dissatisfied with that. And so that was the perspective that I approached the subject from. And it being, um, you know, Greco-Roman mythology, it's well known, it's, um, it's well circulated in Western culture. Right. So mm-hmm. I, I had a lot of, I had a lot more to work with. I had a lot of more room to work with. <laughs> and so it, that, that perspective, I believe is necessary for people to understand where I started. Right. Well, that, that gets to the neat question of, you can do different levels of things with different myths, depending on how familiar you expect them to be to your audience. Yes. So for example, oh, yeah. you can take a really well-known story, Persephone, for example, and you can do a song that's a total inversion of it with a surprise different ending. And everyone will get it because your audience knows that story. If mm-hmm. you do that with an Inuit story, nobody knows the original story. Yeah. So the so impact is going to be much less. So reversal confusion doesn't make any sense as the song operates, and you need to be doing that at a different level. So in a sense, depending on how well-known stories are in your audience's culture, Mm -hmm. Um, it means that you can play with it to different degrees. When I'm doing my Viking stories, I'm usually telling them pretty darn straight because I'm expecting my audience to have a few people who know them well, but a lot of people for whom this is new knowledge. When you're doing something that's Greek or something that's a really familiar Mm -hmm. medieval fairy tale or grim era fairy tale, which is also 19th century, um, yes. you can do a complete reversal and trust that the audience will get it because they already know the original story. And that's a very different kind of narrative construction. And that's also one of the nice things about filk circles is you can dry run material yes. and be able to gauge how, how an audience reacts. Yeah. yeah, how many people know this? You know, what, you know, be able to understand how the audience is reacting to it and do they get it and things like that. And with filk audiences, you'll also get a very wide range of knowledge. Absolutely. And you'll Absolutely. get a wide range of exposure to information. And so you'll get a really interesting cross-section of what a world audience will look like. And so it's, it, it's a very unique resource as far as um, art in general, not just um, song. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to think. We had so much we could go on. So the, um, we could switch over to the music modes. And yes. yes. Switch to music mode for a little bit. Um, yes. So because there are a number of cultures for whom, especially when you're doing very old stuff, you're doing ancient Greece, right? Mm-hmm. Or you're doing Vikings. The challenge there is that we do know what the music sounded like. But for the most part, it was of a sophistication level that makes chopsticks sound like Beethoven. Um, you know, we have Viking music that has three notes because that's what their flute could do. You can't use that. You can't use that for your song. It won't be powerful. Uh, you could use that and make an enormously complicated harmony underneath it. But you, you, if you attempt to accurately replicate what we've researched ancient Greek music would sound like or ancient Viking music would sound like, it's really awkward and is going to have an awkward feel for your audience. Sometimes that might be what you want. Sometimes what you might want is for this song to feel strikingly different, strikingly primitive. Uh, But another thing you can do is say, okay, I'm going for Vikings. And therefore I want music that sounds pre-modern, but I want it to be more sophisticated than four notes. Uh, So my Viking music uses modal stuff, which is in fact Renaissance. Renaissance and very late medieval modal stuff. And it works even though it's several centuries later than the Vikings and isn't something Vikings ever did. Because it feels early, it feels medieval. Our brains know those cadences. We've heard them in medieval music and Renaissance music. So our brain goes, ah, this feels this like is old. something yeah. medieval. This, this is, old. is older. Oh, yes. Works so well a cappella because that is a kind of music too that we associate with sitting around a fire, being in a physical place, being pre the days of orchestras and professional music, mm-hmm. pre guitar, in other words. And so that's a sphere where I can, I can make it feel primitive using the methods which aren't primitive at all, but feel primitive because they code primitive in our minds. 
Mm -hmm. So you replicate the mood even though it isn't accurate. Uh, parallel to the thing I often say when, when costuming Vikings, right? Because we did lots of lovely research and we developed, and we had wonderful SCA people who were willing to lend incredibly detailed, dyed with the real plant, really dyed stuff with things for us for our Viking play. Yes. I love stuff, SCA people so in much. A, in a bright fuchsia tunic with orange and white striped pants. And that would have been so accurate and looked exactly like a clown. And the instant he walked on stage, he would look like a clown and no one could possibly take it seriously. And it wouldn't work even though it's accurate because it goes against what we've learned to think of. Right. And so we put him in blue and red, you know, colors that Vikings did like, but that modern people are also willing to parse. Willing to yeah. actually deal with as serious. Right. And similarly, if I put my Viking music in a Dorian mode or a Mixolydian mode or something, our brains parse that and parse it as medieval so yes. that it feels close. It's, uh, without it's, it's, it's weirdly like what the, and I'm, I'm, I deeply apologize for this a comparison. Um, it's like what uh, the uh, Marvel Comics writers did with early Thor. They don't do this anymore, but the earliest version of Marvel Comics Thor talked no. in this faux King James Bible um, uh -huh. manner, mm -hmm. manner of speech, which was entirely, entirely wrong for what he was supposed to be. But the writer said, oh, the audience will read this and get this is this is a super archaic and B um, this is dignified and imposing, which is the I, mood we want. So the accuracy isn't the important thing. The important thing is the mood. That was yeah. And then later Marvel readers could not take that seriously. So I, they, changed, I, they changed it again. I and, started reading that at that time, and I thought it was silly then. I even was at probably the time, then. <laughs> at least 10 or 11. And and I'm just like, see what they're doing. why they is he talking like this? Like a guy. Yeah, and the problem with Thor often is in Marvel that you just he behaves just like all the other people, and you're like, isn't that one a god and not all the other ones? And it's yeah. you're like, wait, why? Yeah, it's very... tool to differentiate that makes sense. Um, yeah, I know I've seen in more recent music. comics they just put him in a in a in a different font that also it's, isn't remotely like is what not remotely ancient connected. Norse writing looked like, but evokes to the reader a certain feel. And a very good modern, oh, sorry, um, a very good modern example of this musically is the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. The um, the the score for that move for that series of movies evokes so many images of the sea and you know everything nautical and movement and life and it is so immediately reminiscent of the the mood of being on the water and dealing with things like pirates and sailing and things and so it is very possible to get that kind of effect before you even get the words out and mm -hmm. You know, the, the modes that um, Ada is talking about, that's exactly the kind of effect that she's discussing, yeah. is you, you have these things in you, in your memory, in your head that you don't even realize you have, that remind you of these cultures, of these situations. Use that to your advantage. You know, be willing to, you know, go out there and listen to a bunch of stuff and hear the way that this different kinds of music evokes these reactions and evokes these images because there's a reason for it. Yes. I, I just have one follow-up to the Pirates of the Caribbean thing though. Yes. Which is that um, so a couple of years ago, someone was passing around on, on tumblr.com where one sees all good things. Um, a a uh, cover, Oh man, I do. I don't even remember what song it was, but a cover of some contemporary pop song by the Vitamin String Quartet, whom I heartily recommend. They do wonderful string music covers of pop music, and they completely transform what they sound like. And so there was this one particular cover that I saw. I saw someone saying about it. It sounds like a sea shanty. It did not sound remotely like a sea shanty. 
And it took me a while. Oh, oh, this person is thinking it sounds like a sea shanty because it reminds, it is so strongly reminiscent of the theme music to Pirates of the Caribbean. Caribbean, yeah. Yes. Well, and the, there you're seeing an interesting transmission reinforcing itself thing because the soundtrack of Pirates of the Caribbean sounds like, it doesn't sound like real 18th and 19th century sea shanties. It no, sounds it doesn't. like 20th century sea shanties, which were largely influenced and based on the background music that plays during the ride of Pirates of the Caribbean, which opened in the early 20th century. So it's actually invoking a thing that was shaped by itself. Uh, it's the source and also the then receipt as well. Uh, because sea chant because that ride was so famous and so influential that it then came to dominate and it was in turn based on earlier sea chanty stuff but it canonicalized them into these couple being the focus which then became the ones that were most imitated later which in turn then are crystallized into symphonic form so you see that, the transition over and over and over that music was also based on a lot of uh, movie soundtracks from movie the movie soundtracks exactly um, yeah. a lot of of um, Corner yes, and Corn Gold. In, in chat, Hollywood swashbucklers. Bucklers. Yeah, yeah, and which 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 is my favorite things. Um, and so when when those movies came out, I'm like, all this music is really to me. And and they'd obviously drawn from a lot of the you know Errol Flynn movies right. and things like that. And and those drew from earlier sources uh, because they were trying to evoke a mood. Um, as well. So it's, it, it, there's a line to it that it, there's a line of logic to it now, that makes sense, say, but it's still. Uh, all of which is to say that music moves and evolves very quickly, and you often don't want to reach too far back. If what you want to communicate is sea chanty, you want what your audience will feel feels like sea chanty. You mm -hmm. can, as an interesting experiment, go look up some real 18th century music and do something, but it won't pull sea shanty it'll pull much more different yeah, yeah it'll pull something completely different yeah. for your audience if instead you use okay let's look at some mid-20th century pirate swashbucklers because that's what's the actual ur text for most people's mental image of sea mm -hmm. shanty you're gonna get much something that pulls sea shanty much more simply and directly another way to put it being you can only ask the audience to do so many difficult things in a song you can ramp yeah. that up to maximum. You know, I asked the audience to do during, if I could ask you about as much as you can possibly ask an audience to do during a song to the degree that it's hard for audiences and they struggle. Um, and you think, okay, in this song, I want people's mind to be going to sea shanty so that I can then have a reverse deconstruction of Moby Dick where the whale turns out to be his mother. And this is about <laughs> like, uh, a, so uh, in Smith, like Cthulhu, he's an in Smith Cthulhu creature. He's trying to get home and everyone had it wrong the whole time, right? And you're like, okay, that's going to be my twist. And so I want to gradually work in the horror vibe underneath. And, and so I'm going to want with a start with a sea chanty mood and then have a horror mood gradually ramp up, but then have it suddenly become a warm at the end when it's actually a family reunion instead of demon. Okay, that's what I want to have happen in this song. I don't want to also have the sea shanty part at the beginning be using an 18th century sea chanty that has people already working hard on reevaluating what they think sea chanty means. I want to use a mid 20th century swashbuckler soundtrack sea chanty type yeah. melody. You want to be able you want to be able to get your audience there quickly. Okay. If I'm going to then do all that other work of then transforming it first into horror and then into something more. If on the other hand the only thing I'm doing is I'm writing a sea shanty and this is about being interested in the, the sea and the nature of sea shanty, then you may indeed want to reach back further and and pull a historical melody and do something. Well, I mean, it's because it's, it's, that's the focus instead of the narrative being the focus. It's the difference between doing something like a proper mermaid tale, right? Right. Um, which parses immediately as this song is going to be a repetitive sea shanty. A repetitive sea shanty, and it'll probably be dirty or not, right? Um, or at least violent. Or something like that, yeah. Or both. Or both. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you, you get that. But then, like, doing a song like Here's to Valhalla, which isn't really a sea shanty, but it has the kind of, like... Elements? Uh, mm -hmm. It has elements thereof. 
Um, and they, you have to structure them very differently, right? Yeah. Um, well, is Ahab's mom, is that a promise or a threat? I think it's both, Sonia. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. It was just a, let's come up with a, what could be a very complicated monthly layered and yet interesting thing you were doing. in the Yeah, but you bet somebody is now, Ada. Please, somebody Ada, will someday. Great, you know, <laughs> it would be like a weird sideways version of Ruth Ann Amaris's, um, uh Litany of Earth oh, kind wow. of reversing POV, except oh, wow. coming unexpectedly out of. Uh, uh, that, that would be a thing. No, but that what that means, you thing. guys, everybody in chat, that means that Whale as Ahab's mommy is up for grabs. So go <laughs> take it, it, take it, and run with do it. it. Let's do an anthology of them. Um. Anyway, <laughs> um, there are actually a couple of questions in the Q and A that I think we should um, try All to right, tackle. Let's, yes, let's tackle those. I was about to. Open. Um, Wagner oh, synthesized right. North myth with. Schopenhauer's philosophy, yeah. Lucas synthesized Joseph Campbell's scholarship with the science fiction genre, both heavily rely on music to tell the story in their new synthesis, who in today's leading um, synthetic myth builders either is constructing new mythology formats for today's audiences or appropriating music as an aid to storytelling. Myth and punk. we hit on a bunch of this already. Myth punk. Yes. Yeah. Andrew, uh, no, um, I'm not taking questions. Which, 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 I mean, we're a part of. Um, there's a whole lot of people who are taking the classic tales and putting a modern spin on them. Um, and um, um, S.J. Tucker, yep. um, Heather Dale to a lesser a a extent. Um, um, Celia does some of that. A lot of the modern pagan folkies um, kind of fall under the myth punk umbrella we do that's 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 how we define ourselves generally um it's 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 taking um and updating all these stories with with uh you know you know with a modern sensibility so and there's there's modern, an awful lot of that out there and that modern sensibility opens the door to modern musical interpretation and mood mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes definitely. and so that gives you a little more connection to a more current audience if you're going to update that story you're going to want to update the music too and so because once again it establishes that mood um sj tucker is a really good example of this she's a spectacular example of that. she's a spectacular example of this yeah. um alexander james adams is another good one mm -hmm. um alexander also tends toward um, evoking a an old world feel for some of the stories that are much older, but still kind of turning them into something that still feels at least 20th century, if not 21st century, True, definitely. if that makes sense. And so there are just, there are elements within the music itself that he is pulling the audience into that allow them to connect with the music. And so it's um, it's really interesting, it's a really interesting way to do things. Um, Rhiannon's Lark album, uh, Stifle of, uh, of a Phoenix is another really fine example of that. Ada, do you wanna add something? Yeah, it's yeah. a very different kind of example because the question was also, you know, George Lucas is doing this, who in other kinds of productions is making myth and using music with it. There's a very good and very unusual anime called Concrete Revolutio without an N on the end. I, <gasps> the I have not seen that. <laughs> and the best way to describe it is that it jumps past the 101 introduction of these character types. You know what a magical tran girl transformation character is, and you know what a, a Iron Man type powered suit character is, etc. So it doesn't bother to give you the origin story or the introduction of the characters. It's jumping into the level two of this is a world full of anime people. Yes. Uh, of many kinds, including a lot of them from Japanese myth. Uh, let's now see what that does to the legal system and the policing system and international relations. Nice, nice, nice. Mm -hmm. nice. But it, it is so good. But it music as the key because it'll, it'll throw a character in and it needs you in 
five seconds to understand, oh, I see this character is an American female version of Astro Boy, got it. And it needs to achieve that using a combo of character design and music. And yes. so there will be a piece of music each time a new character is introduced that codes to that extremely familiar super archetype. And it's really doing this exact thing where it's, it's you know this modern myth. And here is a piece of music that will immediately make you think of this modern myth. Uh, and now you know this is a Superman type superhero. This is a uh, Doraemon type superhero. This is a, you know, yokai uh, kitsune princess. And it's a combo of the music and the using very familiar character design stuff that does it. Yes. Um, there are yes. lots of comic books that do this, things like Astro City and indeed mm -hmm. uh, Powers. Uh, but uh, Concrete Revolucio really does do it with the soundtrack to a greater degree than most of these others do it with the soundtrack specifically. And yes, Leitmotif is another good way to... Uh, and uh, I, I, I said it as a joke uh, when I brought up uh, Andrew Hussey, but actually I've changed my mind and I'm serious. Um, Andrew Hussey, who was the creator of the Homestuck webcomic. Yes. Um, and I could talk for hours about Homestuck, and I will not, because I want y'all to still like me at the end of the day. Um, <laughs> we will. Don't worry. We will, but okay. that's not a but, problem. But uh, it was a, a, a bizarrely complex webcomic slash walk around video game slash animation slash several other things. Um, and at the point where it, it was quite a while before animation and music got introduced, but once it did, suddenly the music was telling a tremendous part of the story and it was doing things like, um, oh, we, we want to give you the idea that this character's mystical ancestor who may have some bearing on what's happening was a corsair. And so we're going to give you a big floppy coat and a big floppy hat and a little bit of music in the background that immediately evokes two dozen uh, swashbuckling pirate movies, and you will know who this person was. It and it does that again and again and again with, with all these different... Uh, and then you have a piece of music that combines all of the musical tropes you've already heard, and suddenly you realize what it was doing all along. It's... I would hesitate to wholeheartedly recommend Homestuck to absolutely everybody because it's 100% an acquired taste. Well, also, it's on a, a, on a scale of... that it's not a book recommendation, it's a hobby. Yes, also it's huge. Also, it is super huge, but a whole lot of tremendous talent and tremendous insight about how stories work, how myth works, how, how synthesizing of myths works, went into it, and I enjoyed it a hell of a lot. That doesn't Definitely. mean you will. All right, we should probably move on. We have mm. more questions coming up. Lizzie, do you want to grab the next one? Yeah. Um, what about using humor? Example of Paul Eston's retelling of Ramayamam as to the Sock Monkey song. Um, humor is always a good thing to, to go with, but once again, you have to be careful of what you're making fun of and how. Yes. Um, you have to, you have to be there. There is a certain level of kindness that must be applied when you're bringing humor to a situation. Um, you need to be kind to the culture. You need to be kind to the history. Um, be funny. Don't be offensive. And I'm a thin believer line. It in humor, you know, always punch up. Um, yes. Be, 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 be very careful about that. Or um, don't punch in any direction at all. Humor doesn't have to punch. Yeah. If you're gonna yeah. punch, punch up. Yeah, yeah. But, like, a thing I was going to mention before, and then we sort of moved past it when we were talking about particular musical and I would say also poetic styles, some of the most hilarious things I've seen have been taking one culture's story and presenting it in the idiom of another culture. So like the opening to uh, the Iliad done in the um, alliterative non-rhymed style of, of, uh, of um, Norse sagas, 
Mm. Um, or someone, someone did the, uh, someone did the opening of Beowulf as if it were the opening of the Iliad. Oh, uh, and like, that's, that's narrow. Like, you're only going to appeal to a certain audience with that. But for those who get it, it's great. Someone took the opening of the Iliad and made it a rap. So it starts off like, sing to me, muse of the beef of Achilles. And like, I need yes. that. Uh, I need it. Fun. Oh, yeah. oh my um, God. Anybody, for anybody who, um, you know, would like to have, use found lyrics and then make a fun song to it. There's a 1797 English burlesque translation of the Iliad. <gasps> the joking editor says at the beginning, I need all it. All other versions have been ho of Homer have been censored. And this is the first uncensored version of Homer. And then he translates it into incredibly irreverent and dirty English. Need, I need, need, English. need in yeah. my life. Need. Short chunks of that that could be extracted and made into songs very easily. Where do we find it? Where? You just Google burlesque translation of Homer. You'll pop up okay. okay. all over the internet. <laughs> Must and have. It's got like oh, yeah. the you know silly parody versions of Helen interacting. Someone has found it. Look in the chat. There we go. And yes, so it's in the chat. There will be a silk circle juice. based entirely around this song. Thank you, Luke. You could I'm you could do saying. a dozen. You could do a whole album of chunks of this, and it would be you know does five people could do albums of chunks of this, and it would keep on. I, I feel like we could make a folk circle out of that. <laughs> we totally could. Theme circle. All right, Gary, yes. there's an idea I'm, for I'm, next I'm year. I'm suddenly seeing that from the, br the uh, brief history of the world. The, the, you could make a folk circle out of this. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we, we have about three minutes, so we should probably wrap up. Um, one example that I did want to bring up as far as mixing thought processes with different types of music Tom Smith's Rocky Horror Muppet Show. Yes. Is a great example of it's this. It's a fantastic one. And if I may, oh, it's just a jump to the left and a step to the right. You think your face is dozens and bring your knees in tight. But it's the pelvic thrust that drives you insane. Let's do the time warp. Let's do the time warp again. Iambic pentameter is your friend. <laughs> yes. I took no, a course it, on Milton in college and our professor told taught us that you well I'll demonstrate of man's first disobedience and oh, the God. fruit of that forbidden tree. That, that's as far as I am going. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. I hate all of us right now. Um, <laughs> anyway. Us um, um so now now we've given you a whole bunch of new ideas for tonight's mute, folk oh circle. So you guys have a whole bunch of time to write all of these for tonight's folk circle. Yes. I um, adore you, Batya. I hate you, you like, oh, you, you make me so happy. Um, but um, as we wrap up, thank you so much for coming to this panel. We have, there is so much more we could talk about. We could go oh ad God, nauseum go for hours oh, and hours and hours. Uh, Ada? Other micro uh, thing that could make a great folk song suggestion. There's a Chaucer poem called The Shepherd's Calendar, which yes. has one yes, shepherd so singing great. vacuously about peasants and then the other one in between going, hey, ho, the thing you just did. Which if you per have the second person perform it, it ironically, hey, ho, the wind ball. Yeah, it's hilarious. <laughs> uh, and there isn't a musical setting of it. I only know this because I was at an experimental Chaucer circle and we tried How to- How not? Uh, we need to someone do points out this conversation Channel could continue in Discord. Indeed it could and should. It, it could definitely. It could yes. definitely occur in Discord. So thank you so much um, for coming. Silk Dash talking. Music it seems to be the place where people go afterwards. Yeah. Yes. Um, in the in the Balticon area. So mm -hmm. another just as you're singing your myth song, introduce it with obvious love and kindness, and then yes. people will give you a lot more slack. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, indeed. I, I, I it, just one quick thing on that because I I hang out with a lot of parody artists. Um. You could really only make fun of the stuff well that you love. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Otherwise, it always come, comes off mean to me. If it's, okay, I'm just going to make fun of this. No, no. Um, the really great parodies are, are, are parodies that were done by someone who loved the original source. That's why the early Mel Brooks movies are so funny. Because he loved Frankenstein movies. And and he loved old westerns. He couldn't care less about Star Trek. 
And so Spaceballs isn't as funny, you know, right. um, in, in my opinion. But, but, but really only dig into the stuff that you really adore. Mock what you love. Yes. Mm. Because that love. And not even mock, but, 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 but okay. interpret and deal with the stuff that really means something to you. Yeah. All right, my friends. Thank you so much. Um, we will so talk to you guys um, Cheers. This was an awesome discussion. I'm loving reading oh, yes. the yes. side discussion. Thank you cool. so much. See you. And yes, All right. come over cheers, to the because it's with the music, stuff. the sequel. <laughs> and and definitely come to all of the rest of today's concerts. Yes. Oh, yes. A whole bunch. Already off. Yes. All right. See Cheers. you, folks. Take care, folks.